Hello, my friends. Uh, Deepak Chopra here, continuing our conversation with uh, influencers and luminaries, the cutting edge of science, and also, I would say, uh, creativity, uh, because science is an expression of the creative impulse in human consciousness. We have a very special guest today, Gregory Eisner, and uh, uh, co host uh, Rajneesh. Uh, Kamal's going to introduce him and then we'll continue the conversation. We are also joined by Kamal Chanichaya, the Chopra Foundation, which is a non profit 501c3, uh, trying to reinvent the story of humanity. A big, big thing. But uh, a little bit better. So, Rajneesh, uh, please introduce our special and uh, eminent guest. Uh, thank you, Deepak. And it's a great pleasure for me to join uh, in another recording here with you. And uh, uh, Greg, Dr. Greg Asner, uh, he is uh, at the Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science. He's the director at the ASU. Uh, he's also a faculty member of the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning and the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Uh, he's an ecologist. He's quite uh, well known. Uh, he's uh, participated in several programs with NASA, United Nations, uh, anything that has to do with uh, observation of Earth from space uh, and uh, looking at conservation, biodiversity, uh, carbon cycle, animal habitat interactions, climate change. He, he's, uh, I'm so inspired by everything that he does. And one time I asked him, uh, you know, where he was, and uh, I can't even remember where he said, but it was a small island. So I asked him, uh, what are you doing there? <laughs> I loved his response. He said, global ecology. So <laughs> he literally travels uh, everywhere around the globe. And uh, we met uh, a few years ago uh, because we were both uh, working at Carnegie at that time. Uh, Greg has moved on uh, from there since. And uh, we are, started collaborating on class light, which I think we will talk about a little bit. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, colleagues, friends, uh, and been trying to uh, increase the impact of technologies that Greg has developed. And I'm so excited to uh, have this discussion with Chopra Foundation and see how we can um, leverage all of this information and knowledge to, uh, to have a broader impact in improving uh, planetary health, agriculture, and ultimately human health. Wonderful. That's a great introduction. Dr. Osman, thank you for joining us. We'll put all your credentials and website and whatever reference we need to um, at the bottom of this conversation. Um, the URLs and the links. But uh, our audience always likes to know, and we will be reaching 15 million people with this conversation. They would like to know a little bit about you personally, like uh, always we start like that. Do you know, where did you grow up? A little bit about your family, school, education. And sure. How did we get to this point where we are right now? Okay, so tell us about you. Well, thank you. And it's great to meet everyone here. Thanks for the introduction and for the warm welcome. I really appreciate that. That uh, means a lot. Um, I'm coming to you from Hawaii my home state. I'm on the big island of Hawaii. I'm on, the, I'm on the southwest coast in a remote area. And so I'm coming to you by fiber optic with modern technology, but I'm quite a distance from everyone right now um, where I'm working and, uh, and also living. But I was born and raised uh, initially in Maryland on the east coast of the US, uh, not far from Washington, DC. And I, uh, I left there uh, to go to college and I just kept moving west. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I had a, my upbringing was out and about in nature, uh, mostly along the eastern seaboard of the US, uh, marshlands, woodlands, ocean. Um, by the time I made it to, uh, to Colorado, I discovered the mountain, the big mountains, and um, was inspired by those mountains. And I went to school at the University of Colorado. Um, somehow I ended up in Hawaii uh, not too long after that. I must have been about uh, in 
18, 19, 20, somewhere in there. And, uh, and Hawaii, my perspective, because an island Maine in the middle of the Pacific where time has taken its role in, you know, the natural environment really inspired me. And um, the ecosystems that we have here, land and sea, I'm on an island with five volcanoes. Uh, we have some of the wettest places on earth and some of the driest because of the extreme topography and uh, trade winds and the climate system that we have. Uh, it just changed my perspective and, um, and, and formed my, my sense for nature in a, in a more profound way as I, as I got older. Uh, fast forward more years and uh, it was, I realized I needed to, to, to take my education to a higher level, especially after working for a, a nonprofit called the Nature Conservancy in Hawaii. I felt that it was, uh, it was a great start in, in this field, but I needed to get more technical training. So I went back for a PhD back in Colorado. And uh, I, that's when I got into satellites and technology and methods for understanding uh, ecosystems and and uh, and and figured out over time through my PhD that there was no way to really scale up our understanding without the use of technologies like satellites. So uh, that was a major um, part of my my training was was not just the understanding of the need, but also how to do it. And um, back then, satellite imagery was hard to come by, extremely difficult to come by. Um, NASA had a few uh, satellites in orbit. European Space Agency had a few. Uh, that's probably uh, 1995, uh, 97. Uh, very different than today, where uh, in 2021, we have many uh, governments that have Earth observing capabilities. Um, we also have private companies that play a major role in that space. So the world has changed in, in just the way cell, cell phones and those types and laptops and those types of technologies have evolved. So has earth observing. And we, in my world, we use these technologies to understand our, our place at the planet, planetary level and our impact in a way that helps us to manage the earth system better and better and better as, as participants in it. So that's, you know, a, that's a kind of an, uh, and in a nutshell, the, the, the major phases of my um, professional and aspects of my personal life that got me to where I am today. And right now you're in Hawaii. Uh, in, in some remote. And what are you doing there right now? What am I doing in Hawaii? Uh, I'm working from here and it's not only because of COVID-19, but also because I still am inspired by this place. It gives me new ideas. Many of the innovations that we've taken globally were, you could say we're born and raised technologically here in Hawaii, where um, you think of new ways to monitor the earth, you test them out. We have mountains here, we have alpine systems, we have tropical forests, we have um, desert-like systems, we have um, coral reefs. So we have a huge range of ecosystems here in Hawaii that it's almost like a model a model system to um, practice and develop new techniques. And um, so I continue to do that from here. I have a laboratory here, I have a staff here. We've, of course, we've always had a staff on a, in our mainland campus as well. Um, when I first met Rajneesh, as he said, that was at the Carnegie Institution, which was is on Stanford campus in uh, south of San Francisco. And now that part of my program has moved to Arizona but it's the same mix. We have a technology group back in Arizona now that's doing something called data science. It's compute computational analysis of satellite imagery. And then we have our, our program in Hawaii that blends with it to um, provide this model place to, to test where we have all of these ecosystems in Hawaii. And so I, te I tend to bounce between those two locations if I'm not out doing global ecology somewhere else. So, Greg, what would you say is the current state of climate earth? Uh, but if we were thinking of 
our planet as a biological organism uh, with the ecosystem as a self-organizing, self-regulating system. Where are we right now? What is the state of the planet? What are your initiatives and what do you think is the vision of how we could uh, possibly reverse some of this uh, information that's going on at every level of microcosm. And then after you're finished uh, giving us the answer, I'd love to know Rajneesh, how the two of you um, think we should be going in the future and then I'll bring in Kanacha to make some comments. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. I, you know, I think that the answer to your question rests in my experience over the past 25 plus years of doing this. And that is 25 years ago, it was more of an investigation of a, a scientific curiosity where we're wondering what is our impact on the planet? Are we, whether it's the climate system portion of the planet, or if it's um, uh, our forests, our coral reefs, Fast forward to today and it's, we're more in a re responsive mode, almost like a medical center. Um, my, my life and the life of my colleagues and my, my own uh, laboratory went from primarily curiosity driven 25 years ago to primarily responsive to problems, to issues, to the need for um, interventions and for, um, uh, solutions uh, to the the types of challenges we're facing at at, at larger and larger scales, and uh, it, people hear about it. People hear about the climate system changing. People hear about biodiversity loss. People hear about food security issues. These are all real issues that are day to day in my world, and and we're we're busy trying to tackle them in partnerships, in collaboratives. And my and what our team, what our group, and what a lot of what we're talking about today brings to that table are technology aspects of the solutions. Uh, the technology won't solve the problems, but they help us understand them and address problems at larger scales. And so that's a lot of the focus today. And um, and it's it's hectic. There's a, there's kind of a pace to it that's. Uh, you got to get up in the morning ready to go. There's going to be a busy day ahead, and um, it it never stops. It it's if if anything, it's accelerating. I would say that um, some people are quite negative about what we're doing to the planet, and you can look at it that way. I see all of what we're doing as opportunities for not just improving what we're doing, but for innovating as as uh, communities and innovating as governments and if possible and <laughs> innovating as um, as collaboratives to try to come up with solutions. So I, I really focus in that way and I try to focus my people that way as well. What's your prognosis for this plan? Well, we need to, we, the prognosis will be that uh, if we don't do more and at scale, the planet aspects of the planet will become more and more difficult to participate in, whether it's um, water quality and quantity, food security, um, climate itself, uh, and then the biodiversity that we are inextricably linked to, that we can't live without. So we need to secure and, and work on all of these aspects simultaneously, and we need to use our, our understanding of one another and our communities with technology to address these issues. So um, my prognosis is one that feels deeply challenged, but not bleak, not, not, not helpless or hopeless. Um, but we have to work on this and we have to use all that we've got to, to create. What are some of the big initiatives right now? What are some of the big initiatives? Uh, in my world, uh, there are many, but in my world, the, the largest initiatives are those that generate climate solutions that uh, try to draw down some of the, uh, the drivers of climate change, especially carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and natural ecosystems are a really important way to do that. We call it natural capital. Uh, so planting forests, 
restoring forests uh, is one example. And I spend a lot of time on the technology side helping governments all scales from municipality to inter intergovernmental scales to generate those carbon sequestration or carbon capture type of um, activities. And, and, and that's what uh, an entire genre. Equally important is the need to stabilize and reduce the really rapid loss of biodiversity that's occurring. Uh, biodiversity is important for many reasons, whether they're cultural, traditional practice, tourism, uh, but people don't often recognize that they also help stabilize a lot of our natural ecosystems so that they don't go through wild fluctuations. Uh, natural ecosystems with lots of biodiversity are self-regulating. Um, I think of it like a mutual fund versus a stock on the stock market. A stock can be quite volatile, whereas a mutual fund of 100 stocks or 1,000 stocks has its ups and downs internally, but, can, but has a self-stabilizing type of um, uh, characteristic. That's biodiversity and, and a lot of its role in natural systems. And then the third is food security. Uh, quite a lot of work in the area of food security, whether it's um, managing agricultural fields or reducing, uh, let's say, intensifying the, the, the use of agriculture so that we don't remove so much forest. We, we improve the efficiency of the ag land, the agricultural lands that we have today. Those are the types of big programs I'm involved in mostly from a technology point of view, but more broadly as well. Rajneesh, where do you think are the most hopeful initiatives that we need to get global support or expand the conversation so that the general public is more aware of this kind of work? Uh, I, I would start with, with one of the reasons why I first met with Greg, actually. Uh, I approached him because uh, I was more concerned at that time uh, with agricultural outputs and nutrient uptakes into, uh, into our crops. So more of the stock side, uh, not the mutual fund side, uh, because we put a lot of stock in agriculture. And we don't think about uh, what's around uh, surrounding the forests are also important. So when I first met with Greg, he said that uh, he was actually working on this technology, which is now uh, amazing. And it's been applied several times in different regions. Uh, there is a, a LIDAR based mapping where he can uh, identify all the different species of plants. And also uh, using the spectral uh, measurements, he can tell what kind of chemicals are there in leaves. So, so the nutrient wise, even these uh, explorations can tell us how healthy the plants are, what species are there in the entire forest. So that was exciting. Obviously agriculture is easier that way. So I think in terms of telling the public, uh, it's, it's about looking at our planet as one whole and what we do in agriculture uh, is important to us. Uh, and the planet allows us to do that but then we need to be mindful of the forests and all the surrounding areas that are planet's lungs. And, and it's so important for survival of, this, of ourselves. So uh, it, that's, I think globally uh, is what I'm really interested in now. I expanded my vision this way because of uh, learning from Greg as well. And so with Class Slide, which, uh, which is a software that Greg uh, d uh, invented and it's unique uh, in many ways, um, one can uh, look at uh, changes in forests and also use it for agricultural mapping. Uh, but then Greg has many other technologies uh, uh, too. So I'm hoping that we can uh, collaborate with this way and apply these technologies to help many, many efforts that are already underway, but many times they're disjointed. They're not connected very well. So hopefully we can be the glue or, or, the, or bring those, uh, these technologies to to collectively uh, make a bigger impact. So Punacha, we've been talking about uh, this whole idea of reinventing humanity in five areas. The first one being the conglomeration of all the new technologies, um, which I presume class light would be one of the most cutting edge, but also linking that to everything else that we know from artificial intelligence to bioregulation to uh, 
VR, augmented reality, and all that. So that's one area that uh, uh, these guys who talk about uh, reinventing humanity are talking about. And then um, other things like uh, the creation of new matter rather than extraction, then the creation of new food through precision fermentation, but also through other technologies, starting from atoms and molecules and genes. Um, the third one being transportation, the fourth being energy. Uh, and uh, have I missed something, uh, Punasha? No, I think you covered material. Major, major. All five of them are there. And the material. All five of them. We need to tell a new story that combines this amazing insight and technology and this amazing creativity. But we do need a new story. We need the public to be aware of that. We need educational institutions to be aware of that. Even musicians and songwriters to be aware of that. If you want to change the story, it can't remain within academia and science, which is what happens. You know, I've been in academia for so many years and amazing things are happening, but nobody knows about them. So where do you think, um, especially class light, which is very impressive as a technology, you can look at a forest now and compare it with probably what it was 10 years ago. Can we do that, uh, Greg? Uh, or uh, any environment, a natural environment, we can actually look at it now, look at it where it was then, and even predict where it's going. So first, Punacha, uh, any comments from you, and then back to Greg. So I think I have a couple of questions, actually, Greg. I think this is very interesting and fascinating as a technologist. You know, you have a plane which you can fly with layer LiDAR, but I think with IoT, awareness is key to transformation. Like, people don't get diabetes overnight. You know, forests don't disappear overnight. In some, in some areas, I guess they do. But it's a slow kind of, if, if I knew what is happening in my community, I would be more aware. If your financial system is not good, you have a credit score, right? You have a, you have a, a dashboard in your car. But as we look, look at ecology, the environment, there's no dashboard. So one of the things when you look at this technology, look at urban air, we have a place called Lake Nona, which is home of the Cooper Foundation, Orlando. I'm fascinated to bring this technology it's almost having a real-time meter in communities, which talks about how are they doing? What is the health of your ecosystem today, both in urban and in rural? So when you look at things like IoT and IOE with continuous monitoring, what is your vision of how cities such as Lake Nona, a smart city can adopt it? And what are, that's first question. Second question is what are your, look at benchmark. Who are the governmental organizations or countries who are doing a good job? What are they doing good? And are there some use cases we can talk about? Great questions, not easy to answer. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the technology and its role in creating the kind of real-time dashboard, the capability to understand what's happening, but in a way that's actionable or that you can be community, whatever scale we're talking about, the community, the city or the county or the, the or something larger, whatever, the technology has to be able to make action uh, possible, obviously. And that is by, I guess, a few different key characteristics. One is the data, the information have to be easy to access. And so class light, you know, um, Deepak said something super important about uh, coming out of the academic world. You know, it's, Working with Rajneesh and getting this kind of technology out isn't just, okay, here's software, have at it, enjoy, uh, please, good luck. It's really a process of partnering outside of academia and then embedding it in uh, communities at different scales. So, and then the technology has to be, uh, pardon me, the technology has to be, um, accessible by those who need the information the most. So the second characteristic that I cannot emphasize enough is that the information that we glean from the technology has to be resolute or have meaning at the scale of the human enterprise, at the scale of something you and I understand, trees, for example, not something broad and esoteric, not a, not a picture, not a map that that 
by by virtue of the map right away you don't feel connected to the to the environment around you so class light is designed to be information rich and and fine resolution like like geographic resolution detail but also the information is rich so that uh, work can do it when it comes out of the computer so to speak um, and the third is that it needs to be timely and so class light was built to uh, be able to do all of this by you know almost non-experts you need some training but there's you know quite a low bar we've lowered the bar from that esoteric academic bar to something that many people can can um, pick up and use and and that makes the information more and more timely so that we're not waiting a year to find out that we lost our forest three miles away uh, and just didn't notice it because it's behind you know a hedge or behind out of sight and so you know the all of this has to come together and we focused very much on, on making those major characteristics uh, blended and, and really come out in a product like Classlight and other products that, we, that we've dealt with, that we've created. I want to ask you one more question to that. Is this, is this a possibility? So one of the visions I had in Lake Nona, the community I am in, I'm in, is to have a social network of trees, an Instagram of trees. If trees could have a network and every child in the community could adopt a tree, Right. Mm. So I have a tree I, and I adopt that tree and every day I get to see how the tree is doing. I think if we become more connected, I think we would actually become more. We don't see the disconnection. I think a lot of the thing today is that it's me. I'm there. It's all good. Right. So I think we need to realize that the trees are actually not suffering right now. It looks OK. But you know what? Deep down, it's suffering. I think that could be a huge benefit to communities, especially in urban urban areas. Right. And I think that the technologies that we have today are ready to feed into those. I don't know if they're social media platforms or apps. Of, there's some sort of way for people to connect through the technology, not with the technology, but use, pass through that technology to those trees and to be and to have that connection. And that's cert, from a technological point of view, that's certainly achievable. Uh, it's really a social science and a social um, engagement problem more than a technology problem at this point. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, you know, especially for Lake Nona, uh, the, that is certainly possible and it could be a good place to pilot something like that uh, and uh, even have an app where uh, some of the information about the trees that the people are interacting with is fed to them. And so they get excited about it every, every couple of uh, times a month or something like that. But then, you know, also going back to uh, what uh, Deepak was uh, saying earlier, I completely agree. I think the the reason uh, I even started iCultivare, which was about five years ago, was exactly to do that because there is so much technology in academia and it's so well understood and uh, it can do amazing things, but it's very difficult for it to actually step out and actually do those things. And a lot of that is because of uh, many ways that we are, we people uh, who are doing different tasks everywhere we are so used to doing them in certain ways and we are happy with the things just the way they are. It's very hard to think, look at something and uh, accept it and then adapt it. So uh, hopefully, um, you know, iCulture is, is just a node and uh, uh, what we have done is brought in uh, experts like Greg and, you know, uh, other people uh, in the food and agricultural area and consciousness. And hopefully we can bring all these people together at, in one platform with technologies and, and at some point we can start to make those connections, especially with the Punacha's dream uh, of IoT because all these data can feed into, into this, uh, uh, keeping a pulse of the planet and keeping a pulse of each location. Uh, so we can act when there is a need uh, to act somewhere. So, you know, as I was listening to this conversation, especially what Greg said, you know, the big picture is so complex and complicated that you have to start with something little like a tree. Okay, let's see the health of this tree, uh, or let's see the health of this particular species of plant or animal, whatever. So I want to share with you a story, um, which is anecdotal, but I'm sure we can find the reference sometime, somewhere. But um, about 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, I read about a hybrid uh, rice that was introduced 
uh, to a population somewhere in Bangladesh. And forget my, you know, I forget all the details, but I'm giving you the story, okay? the gist of the story. So hybrid genetically engineered rice is introduced to this community, let's say Bangladesh, and it replaces the crop that they usually have, which is basmati rice. Okay, and as you know, some of us who are fond of basmati rice, it has a very wonderful smell to humans, but apparently has a smell to birds and bees too. So when this was replaced, uh, the birds, the bees started uh, avoiding this particular region. This altered the entire ecosystem, uh, the entire flora and fauna of the region, ultimately affecting weather patterns, ultimately causing uh, strikes by farmers, uh, resulting in mass migrations, um, uh, changing of stock market prices, and violence. So just because one grain of rice genetically altered information that doesn't fit into the ecosystem. Okay, so now let's take that little bit of insight and ask ourselves, is any, any reductionist solution um, going to help? Or do we have to look at an entire ecosystem and everything that's happening. You said, you know, you have glass light looking at the condition of the plant, but how about glass light um, 102 or 103 or 105 that looks at uh, weather patterns, that looks at the same time at, uh, at, at the entire ecosystem of species. You know, we just saw in this, uh, in this uh, area uh, in uh, Florida where they restored the path of the panther. Uh, as soon as they restored the path of the panther, other species got resurrected, you know, uh, because, you know, what is good for one species is part of a biodiversity, uh, ecological, self-regulating system. So where can we go with these kinds of technologies in the future that we're not only monitoring um, um, just the health of a tree. Uh, and, you know, I recently interviewed a woman from British Columbia uh, who's written a book somewhere here, uh, Havoc, on mother trees. And what she says is in British Columbia, she's identified these trees that she calls mother trees that use a network of fungal a network, almost like a brain, to communicate and uh, help other trees stay in good health, not only of the same species, but other species. Now, if all that is true, then uh, there should be a way of looking at technology and algorithms that correlate one activity in the forest, which we can say is a healthy activity, and how it's alterating, alter, altering the entire ecosystem holistically. Uh, just a thought, but I'd like your comments, uh, Greg, and yours too, with me from Andy and where we should do, you know, we have some very big initiatives coming at Lake Mona and maybe in other communities. So how, if you had to pick one project to take class life, what would it be, um, Greg? Well, you, you know, your story about the rice, it's, 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 so apropos in, to my world. And it's interesting. I, I guess in a way, I don't know the, the, the answer, but in a way I know major steps towards an answer. And one is that, you know, in, in my world, we do, we, we're getting better at understanding what I would call the teleconnections between these processes that you're referring to. How one, one thing affects another and it's both um, unintended consequences and intended co intended consequences, kind of these interconnected rippling effects. And our models and our science, our global ecology, it, it is getting better and better at understanding that, but it doesn't do a good enough job at, it, it, at rolling in the participation of the individual as, a, as part of that feedback loop, as part of that system. It makes it very hard 
it's, it makes it tough in, to, for us to have these models and this technology and, and understand more and more and more of these interconnections that you referred to. It makes it tough to make those actionable without individual human participation in the process and in the feedback loops. And so what do we do? I mean, I don't know all of the answers, but I know that in, in my part of the, of the equation, I, you know, the technology needs to allow and foster individual participation within the context of the, the more interactive, larger system. Um, we're not there yet. We need to accelerate in those spaces. That's just critical. And it doesn't matter if you're working on a project in Florida or, or one over here in Hawaii or anywhere on the planet, the same approaches probably apply where you're, you're dealing with large scale forces and interactions at different scales with individuals who are participating in that process, even if they're only interested in their backyard or, or their walk to work or whatever it is, it, you know, we, we're just not there yet at integrating those, but we need to push on those frontiers. That's, that's the sense I got when you told your story. I see. Yes, I, I, I also uh, agree with that. I think to, to cause a meaningful change, uh, participation at, at those each uh, people who are actually uh, part of the whole ecosystem, they have to get involved. And, and uh, Dibagat, what, what you're doing, I think is, is uh, so important to, to educate people and share uh, all these things with, with all the people uh, who, who get to know uh, what is out there, what technologies, what, what we are capable of at least now and then how we can uh, change our habits or change what we are doing, look at things slightly differently around us, pay attention to the trees as we go to work. Um, and, and then maybe we can make it more interactive. And if we can make it more interactive and engaging, then it becomes a sort of a habit. So hopefully we can uh, maybe Lake Nona and also maybe in Hawaii, uh, maybe we can start some of these programs as, as pilot to, to see if we can start to uh, um, involve more participation and engage more people uh, towards uh, causing a positive change. So before I ask Punacha to uh, comment, and this will be the concluding part of our interview because we can't go on for more than a certain time to reach um, everyone, we can come back. Um, here's a uh, thought, uh, you know, right now in my field, which is medicine, biology, uh, in Washington, there are 28 healthcare lobbyists for every congressman. And you know, uh, lobbyism is a nice word for um, uh, official, uh, whatever you want to call it, corruption or whatever. 28 healthcare lobbyists, mostly representing either the healthcare industry in terms of pharmaceuticals or diagnostic activities, but they take congressmen out for parties and so on and influence healthcare policy. The same thing is happening in the military industrial complex. You know, it's just these lobbyists control everyone. It's very obvious that governments and notwithstanding that there are some good things happening, but in general, governments and businesses, all these big institutions, Wall Street, interests, uh, they, you know, they're short-term thinkers in what is good right now for jobs, what is good for politics, who wins, what is the next election cycle. And over the years, I've realized that unless we democratize um, certain initiatives by expanding awareness, uh, which is what we're doing in this conversation, you can only think, uh, change what you're aware of. If you're not aware of class light, then you don't know class light it doesn't exist. And it's out of your awareness. So when we expand awareness and we identify these problems, uh, Punacha, since you know we are all about Sangha, uh, global communities, and Seva, which is service, and then a deeper reflective process that we call Sadhana, where we say, you know, we need creative solutions and we can't depend on special interest groups. Can we create a global and I'm, I'm, you know, you might think I'm totally crazy about it, but a global volunteer army, so to speak, of younger people, including students of ecology, um, but also storytellers, also songwriters, also poets, 
also other people in the education field. So we have a global army of whatever we want to call them, that they are restoring peace, balance, social and economic justice, because they're connected. You know, everything is connected. Climate change, sustainability, social justice, racial justice, gender justice, economic justice, ecology, war, terrorism, and technology, good and bad, divine and, di divine and diabolical. This is all connected. Now, we recently launched an initiative that Pradacha has been championing uh, on mental uh, illness amongst especially teenagers and suicide prevention using an AI bot. And the people are more engaged with this AI bot than with therapists, and she's actually saving lives. So how do we democratize a movement for restoring ecology through a global network of passionate people and self-aware people who see these connections? Or is that just a pipe dream? Uh, Nasha. I think one of the things I want to kind of add over here, Deepak, is that what is our moonshot, right? So the moonshot is that we got to have something we can normalize conversation. So we look at inflammation. So what I was excited about last slide is that inflammation is physical. We look at five pillars of the Chopra Foundation, physical well-being, mental well-being, social well-being, planetary well-being, and spiritual well-being. If I look at inflammation as the low, as indicator of well-being, that's physical well-being of the body is inflamed. When we look at, if you look at environmental inflammation, when the PM 2.5 levels are high, when the, air, the forest cover is depleted, when the soil potency is low, that's also inflammation, right? So if we can create, one of the things we have embarked on is creating what we call the well-being genome index. What is the well-being of a community, physical, mental, social, planetary, and spiritual? I believe we can create a global index where I can go and drill down and say, what is the inflammation? What is the well-being in, in Hawaii, in India, or in a city, Bangalore, Orlando, Florida. And when people have that level of information, awareness is key to transformation. And this is where science and technology today is converging. We, have, we could not do it before because we didn't have a resolution of mapping. If I can now map at a pixel level at a tree, and I can do correlation. Correlation and causation are two different things, right? I can go back and now correlate. When the plant is thriving, what is the air quality? I can ask through my AI chatbot, how do I feel today? How do you feel? So I think today we can measure well-being at home, at work, on the road, and at play. So I believe we are uniquely positioned to come together. This is the Sangha, right? It takes a village to bring up a child. But I think if we can rally together, use a metric like inflammation, and the project which we are working, the Chopra Foundation, and the Global Well-Being Genome Index, I think we have a pretty interesting solution. Well, this is a conversation that needs to be continued. Obviously, we haven't solved any problems right now, but we've all expanded our awareness that we have. And I think uh, we need to pick one or two projects um, on class light and move forward. So if uh, anyone has last minute comments, uh, uh, before I suggest the title for this conversation, Gregory, do you have any last comments please no i just want to thank you all Deepak. i want to thank you for hosting me and um i i'm inspired by the conversation i'm, I'm inspired to keep pushing forward thank you thank you for joining us and educating us um, rajneesh any last comments yeah, I'm, I'm also excited to be a, a part of it and hopefully uh you look you know working together with greg and, and chopra foundation uh, I'm uh, just looking forward to how I can contribute and continue to work together.